Day because he is the good, good father. And happy Father's Day again from the church to you. Glad that you're here. It shows you what a good dad you are if you're in church on Father's Day. So give these guys another praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> I heard about the kids that all got together and they were going to have a little kind of a toy raffle for the kid uh, who uh, had been the best kid in the house that week. So five kids in the family, they all gathered around and were anxiously going to see who's going to get the prize. And so mom begins to ask the question and it was like something like, uh, who hadn't talked back to their mama this week? You know, who did everything mama said? Who was obedient every time she requested something? Nobody raised their hand. They all finally turned around and said, Dad, looks like you're the winner this time. So, Anyway, <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, we ought to honor our fathers. You know, we've set aside a national holiday and a recognition for Father's Day but in reality, the Bible doesn't do it like that. The Bible just says, honor your mother and your fathers. And by the way, kids, unless you haven't read that, that means every day, all right? We honor them. We recognize them. That's in Ephesians chapter 6. And in fact, the Bible lets us know clearly that is the first commandment with a promise, all right? So that it may be well with you, so that your days may be long. In other words, God says, if you will honor your parents, I'll extend to you a great blessing in your life. And uh, that's just, uh, you know, that's, that's not a false promise from a car salesman. That's straight from the Scripture. So you can count on that, and you can believe God. I want to talk to you, to dads mostly today, and because we do want to honor our dads. And I do want to encourage you with this message today, and I want it to be a blessing to you. Yeah, I, ho I hope it challenges you at the same time and has a, with it that component that gives you a com just a passion to be more of what God's called you to be in your life. You know, I, th I think it's, we just realize that uh, these are, are, are difficult days for, for parenting, all right, mothers and fathers. In fact, I've entitled the message today, Warrior Dad. And I think that that's a good title for the culture, the generation, the time that we're living in, that there is a need for warrior dads. Dads who will rise to the occasion and be that, that, that warrior dad in the midst of the situations that we face every day in this culture, in our homes, in our families, in our lives. Because we are in a war, a spiritual war is literally raging around us every day. And so I think one of the great needs of the hours for dads to realize that, hey, we're fathers on the front line. You know, we're dads on the front line of the battle. And the battle is not somewhere over in the Middle East and, or Far East or the Korean Peninsula or, or, or in Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran. Listen, the real battle is in our homes every day. And all too often that battle is, is being lost, especially, I think, in the culture that we're living in. I want to just kind of sh share with you a, a biblical scenario. Obviously, it's, you're in church, amen. So uh, we want to open up our Bibles. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. I'll put it on the screen in just a moment. But in Judges chapter 2, there's a passage of scriptures that describes a generation of people, all right? And then we're going to read from another passage that's written prior to that passage to show you where these people were and what was happening versus where they had been. And I think it's important we look at this passage today because it talks about a generational loss. In other words, there was a generation that came, served and worshiped the Lord, and then a generation that followed that lost the battle completely and completely rejected God. And I think we're seeing in our culture today at an alarming rate the next generation departing from the faith instead of embracing the faith of their fathers and their, and their grandparents. They're just kind of moving on in their own direction. And the things that were important to their parents in, in a spiritual realm are not so important to the next generation that's come along. And I think we really need to have a time of recovery and, and a healing and a revival in our nation if we're going to see this take place. In fact, the Bible tells us in Malachi that one of the great signs of revival is when the children's hearts return to their fathers and also to the, to the God of their fathers. So let's look in Judges chapter 2. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, we'll honor the reading of the word this morning. In chapter 2 of Judges, verses 6 through 12. And it says this, that when Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. And verse 8 goes on to say, Then Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to the fathers, and there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. 
and the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Verse 12, And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed themselves down to them, and thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So you see a whole generation that rejects what went on before them when that generation passed away. Now, before you're seated, let me say this. It was a time that the children, before they would forsake God, would at least wait till the parents died, all right? <laughs> We're not having that in the culture we live in today. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. If you'd like, I'm going to also read. I'll have it on the screen, but if you have your Bible, if you want to flip back a few pages to Joshua 24, I want to show you where the nation was before we get to this departure that we've just looked at, all right? Where were they and what was going on in the people, in the people's hearts and life? Remember, they've left Egypt. They've been in the wilderness 40 years. Joshua leads the people into the land, and there are great, phenomenal victories and glory that God manifests among his people. So they're seeing God do many, many, many great things in their midst. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great things and signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in the land, who we also, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Now, here's this moment. The people are embracing the truth of God's word, of God's leaders, and it's an exciting moment. Now, Joshua's getting old. After we see, if we go through a few, four, four more pages forward to the chapter we read at first, he passes away at 110. But it says, all those who were of his generation, and all those who came out of the wilderness into the promised land, and those elders and their families who saw the great work of God, they're saying, we're going to serve the Lord. And we see him serving the Lord until that generation passes. Now, as I said all too often now, we don't wait for a generation to pass before there's departure from the faith. We're seeing it happen on radical levels in the culture in which we live. And it's, it is a heartbreaking thing. I really believe in all my, with all my heart, we need to see another great move of God. We really need to see a great move of God that sweeps across the globe, at least across the nation, if we're going to save this next generation, if they're going to be spared. You know, it was in, when I was a young man, and, and that was like 100 years ago for those who are counting. Back when I was coming out of, in high school, coming out of high school, there, there began this great move of the Spirit of God back in, you know, in 68, 69, 70, 72, mid-70s. We called it the Jesus Movement back then. You know, it wasn't like some of the great awakenings of the past, revivals of the past, but at least there was a spark and an inkling of a move of God in the nation. So much so, the whole nation was taking note. For those who lived back in that time, if you're still among us, uh, you know what that was like. It was a time of great excitement, I and mean, people were getting saved. Thank God that it happened, because that generation which I was part of was getting ready to be completely lost to the whole drug culture, the whole party movement, the whole free sex movement, all that was going on. There was this immorality that was invading the land on a mass level, and drugs had spewed up like vomit across the nation, and people were being sucked into that. And then all of a sudden, there came this glimmer of hope we called the Jesus Movement, and people started getting saved. I, I remember those early days. I, I got saved in that, that movement. I, I remember those days, how exciting it was. You know, we, we were able, as young preachers and evangelists to go into schools and public schools and preach the gospel and give invitations. I, I know what it's like to stand in, in, a, in a public school auditorium filled with students and be able to preach the gospel freely and give an invitation and watch hundreds of kids come forward and give their life to Jesus Christ. I remember one, one day we were at Jersey Village High and we had 900 students there. I would say 90% of those students filled the altar, either getting right with God or getting saved as we preached the gospel. Man, what, and those were phenomenal days. It was just exciting to see what God was doing. 
and it was affecting the churches even. I mean, the churches who would embrace what God was doing saw God do some things. But it has been a long time since we've seen that kind of activity of the Spirit of God in our nation. And we are long overdue. And I pray every day that God would send some kind of stirring and some kind of revival and some kind of great work from heaven so that this generation, all right, the millennials and younger could see God move in such a dynamic, real way, it would blow your mind, literally, to see all that God does. All those folks that you thought were unreachable, repenting and weeping and getting saved and getting right with God, there's nothing like it. There's nothing so as exciting and so stirring as that. That's what we need to see. And remember, these people are telling Joshua, hey, we've seen God move in our midst. We've seen him drive out the enemy before us. We've seen him part the waters at the Jordan and bring us into the land safely. God, give us a time like that again. And if, it, if, if we don't pray, and if we don't go to war now, spiritually speaking, and stand against the enemy of our soul, then we may not see a time like that again. Because what is happening, pretty much what's happened before in history, even in this passage we read, that next generation begins to seek after other gods. Now, we don't <coughs> uh, seek the gods of the Amorites and the Egyptians anymore. I mean, we don't have little uh, amulets that we're all wearing and, and golden idols and copper and brass and silver and stone that we fashion and bow down and offer incense and worship. Uh, we just worship a completely different kind of God today. It's really the God of ourselves, all right? We become vain in our imaginations, as the Scripture think, and we think that we are it. And we no longer, you know, fashion idols and, 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 and put them before us. It's the idols in our mind. The Bible says we've chosen to love the world and not to love God. Remember what's called the world and what we mean when we say the world, we love the world and not love God? It means to, it, he talks about it in, in 1 John 2, he says it's, it's the lust of the eyes, the, you know, the pride of life, you know, the lust of the flesh. In other words, it's, it's about getting stuff and getting more stuff. It's about satisfying our immoral desires and it's about exalting ourselves. That's, 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 that's the culture. So it's, this, it's the world system. We've, we've pursued the world system. We don't spend our time in church. We spend our time in front of TVs. We don't spend our time in front of the Bible. We spend our time at, at, the, at the newest movie that's out. We, we don't give a lot of attention to what God's Word has to say. We want to know what's fashionable and what's, what's culturally relevant at the time and what's being tweeted in the moment, all right, instead of what's been written for all eternity. We just, we just worship in reality, not God, but, a, but attention and self and this cultural system that we, we built ourselves around. And we have completely missed God. Where is God in our thinking? Where is God in our living? Where is God in our decision processes? There's a chapter in Romans, chapter 1, that's so profound. I encourage you to read it sometime. And I want to read you a few verses from it, but it is certainly an accurate description of the culture that we're living in. Listen to this in Romans 1, 28. Furthermore, and he's talking about Paul in the New Testament in the first century. He's describing what life was like in the Gentile Roman world. They do not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. In other words, they don't want to think about God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. Tell me if this next verse doesn't sound like off the headlines. They are full of envy and murder and strife, deceit, malice, with every kind of wickedness, he says. Strife and malice. This is the next word. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They, they invent ways of doing evil. Pay attention to this next verse. They disobey their parents. You think that'd go in there with all that other godlessness, but God thinks it ought to be there. This one's more accurate here. They are senseless. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Don't prove yourself senseless. Faithless, heartless, ruthless, and although they know God's righteous decree that they that do those things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Well, that's some powerful words. It kind of gives us an idea of the culture of where we're standing today and what we're facing. And everywhere we turn, this battle is raging on to pull our 
children and our grandchildren and our families away from God and into that culture. You don't have to watch TV very long to see an accurate description of Romans chapter 1. You don't have to watch primetime family TV even very long to see an accurate description. It's, 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 if it's about God, it's rejected. If it's about God, it's, 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 it's laughed at. If it's about God, then it's, it's an issue of mocking. I remember catching a news clip of the Attorney General Jeff Sessions this week quoting a Bible verse. God forbid that we ever do that in public. And it was so amazing to me to watch one media pundit after another media pundit ridicule him, laugh at him. It went into absolute discussions with discussion panels on the news networks. Should we be using the Bible? I mean, it's not culturally relevant anymore, right? It's not, it's, you know, hey, this is the Word of God. It's amazing that we've come into a place, where, into a nation that says, in God we trust on our money, and we can't use the Bible verses in a public format. And if we do, then we're laughed at, and then we're ridiculed. It's just time for, to, for, for believers to make a fresh stand and just live out loud and live a daring, bold Christian life and just say, this is who I am, you know? If we can get, you know, the, the LGBT community to come out of the closet, maybe we can get the, church, the Christians out of the churches, out into the world where we ought to be. Amen. And shining like light and life. What a, what, a, what a way we've come away from. How far have we missed God in this? So how, how are we going to defeat, or even how can we win this battle with our children and with our children's children? How, how are we going to survive this? Uh, one more Bible verse. Y'all do like the Bible, I'm glad. It's, it's not one more, there'll be a few more, you know me. Here's, this, here's where I want to make suggestions how we win the war. Here it is in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. These words, which I'm commanding you today, shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you will bind them upon the sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. Now, first of all, he says it's got to be on your heart. How do we win the war? It's got to be on our heart. And then he gives us a real clear instruction of how we deal with the issues that are contrary to the truth. And we do it first, mostly what we're getting here is you keep presenting truth. You keep presenting truth. So let me just briefly, all right, so take a breath. <laughs> briefly give you three things I think that will help, especially warrior dads, win the war. One, you win the war with words, believe it or not. You're not going to win the war with more money. You're not going to win the war by buying your kids more stuff. I mean, we like to bless our kids. That's great. But that's not the way you win the war. You're not going to buy your kids affection. You're not going to buy their love. You're going to win this war that they're facing, a spiritual war, with spiritual words, which is the Word of God. These commandments I give you today, they're going to be upon your heart, and you will impress them upon your children. What's that mean? I think it's contemporary English version says, you'll tell them over and over and over again. Once is not enough. Occasionally is not enough. This is something you do over and over and over again. I think we've mentioned before a particular social study that took place with hundreds and hundreds of dads where they, they went into homes and they sit down with dads and they were talking about the importance of fathers in the home and the institution of the home. And they asked the dads in this survey, how much time do you spend a day in real conversation with your sons and your daughters? And this was middle-class America that they took this survey from. And the survey came back. Dads all said, as an average, huh, 15, 20 minutes a day. Well, we got work, you know, and we're gone when they get up. We have to go to school. So, you know, only average 15 to 20 minutes a day. But they didn't take the dad's word for it. They didn't then, for this period of time that was pre-selected, they put microphones on the kids that they had to wear all day so when dad was home. And they discovered that dad did not spend 15 or 20 minutes a day talking to their kids in any kind of real communication. But on average, not 15 or 20 minutes, but the average, they said, was about 37 seconds a day. Maybe they thought that one little two-second period when they said, go ask your mom, that counted for two or three or four or five minutes, I don't know. <laughs> or that period where they said, don't bother me now, that that counted for a couple of minutes. Or I've got other stuff to do. Can't you see I'm busy? Isn't that amazing? The average, they said, the direct interaction was limited to about 2.7 encounters daily, lasting at least 10 to 15 seconds each. 
how can you speak the words into those lives that they need to hear? Now, uh, without going into it, we know, especially those who are regular tenders and members of Believer's Fellowship, of the importance of the Word of God and the priority of the Word of God, and that it is a living Word, and it must be planted in people's lives before it'll bloom. And the heart needs to be a fertile area which that seed of God's truth is planted, in, and out of that fruit can come. But it's, it's something that's not done once, but it's done all the time. We cannot let the world put their words into our children's hearts and minds. They do already. They get it through digital media. They get it through their Facebook. They get it through their devices. They get it through TV. They go to public schools for the most part and getting secular education. You know, I, I, there's nothing wrong with a secular education as long as secular philosophy is not inbred into it. And what happens is that too many teachers today, they leave off the educational aspect and spend too much time presenting their philosophy and their philosophical opinions about the world in which we live in. So how do you know that? I went to school. It's hard to believe, I know. <laughs> but I did. And so there's this element we've kind of trust. Well, we'll take them to church, Pastor. So, you know, that, hey, I think it's important you bring your kids, you educate them, and I think it's important you bring them to church because at Believer's Fellowship, we're not we're going to do anything but pour the word of God into them, Amen. Through every program, from it's from children to youth to singles, adults, all it's just the word, the word, the word. All right, but that's still not enough. We're not here to do your role in ministry and raising your children. We're just here to supplement. All right, and to stand with you, encourage you, help you, and to and to and to be a partner with you. But ultimately, it stops with mom and dad. But I really believe. Really, it's like Ronald Reagan had that little sign on his desk. Remember, the buck stops here? Dad, the buck stops here. Amen. And we need to be warrior dads who realize, hey, I've got to make time take time to do what needs to be done, to say what needs to be said, and to put into their life what needs to be said. And by the way, if you have children, all right, that makes you a dad. So when do you quit being a dad? Never. All right? You never quit giving these words. You never quit having the input in their life. As long as you're dad, they're your child. Yes, they may move away. Yes, they may start their own family. But you have this, this, this opportune, opportune place in life to continue to pour into them. In fact, there's so many passages in Scripture that talks about how a father should instruct his children, but it even many of those passages include father and your father's father, grandfather's. And so we have this place of pouring into the Word. Now, they, unfortunately, they may not always believe the Word, all right? They may not always believe you. Sometimes it might be your opinion as far as they're concerned. Amen? But you still keep preaching the Word. I had a great opportunity yesterday. My kids came over, and we had a lot of fun, fellowship. And I got cards from my kids. I still like the old Apple back box thing, personally, you know, <laughs> that was in the video. But it was interesting. I was laughing, and they said, what is so funny is I was reading the cards. You know, I'm laughing, and they said, what's so funny? I said, well, I just read Cherish's card, and I just read Joseph's card, and I know you guys haven't talked to each other about what you wrote in the card to me because they don't, you know, they just, they didn't let Hallmark say it all. They wrote their own thoughts in there as well. And I said, you both started off with the same sentence. Well, what's that? Dad? We may not always agree. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, but that pretty much makes fun. But still, we're going to keep saying what we're going to say. Amen? It, it, we, especially when it comes to the truth of God's Word. I've certainly got opinions on everything, so I don't know if they'll agree with that. But the ones that are about truth and about Scripture, we want to agree on. So we do this with our, wor with our, with our words. But with a part of that, and all... In, embedded in that is obviously we do it with our time you know we use the illustration about the few seconds 37 seconds but how are you doing with your time what we're doing with that is we're taking the word but if there's no time spent then how are we going to do what needs to be done deuteronomy 6 talks about you know you, you teach them diligently to your sons and daughters you can't do that if you don't invest your time you know where the scripture talks about when you sit at home when you walk along the road when you lie down when you get up I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in family devotion, all right? I believe you've got, kid, you got kids at home. You can be having a time to pray together, and, and whether it's every day or every other day, however you choose it. But bigger than that, here's what I'm a proponent of, all right? 
Because my kids can't tell you one thing I ever taught them in a family devotion. <laughs> but what they do remember is those times when we were in the way, along the road, when we were out in, in the affairs life, when we were in the grocery store. The lesson they learned there, when we were on the, out on hunting or fishing or doing the things that we'd go do together. Every one of the things that we would do, they didn't always see it, but it was my opportunity to teach them something. My opportunity to instill another biblical principle in their life. My opportunity to take the word and keep presenting it. Where? When you sit down, when you get up, all right? When you're out in the field, when you're at, whether you're at home, or when you're just walking along the road, all right? It's just everywhere that we go, we're in this process of investing our time into their lives. And if we miss that opportunity, man, you've missed the most beautiful opportunity because that's where they learn faster than just sitting down in a Bible study. They embrace that much faster. Proverbs 4 says this, My children, listen to your father's teaching and pay attention so that you will understand what I'm telling you is good. So do not forget what I teach you. When I was a young boy in my home, my father's home, and he goes on and said, it was my father who taught me in the house. And like an only child to my mother, my father taught me and said, hold on to my words with all your heart, keep my commandments, and you will live. That's what we keep pouring into our kids. It's just truth. We just keep giving the truth. And you know as well as I, there's so many things that happen every day. Sometimes just even watching TV, I just hit the pause button and we just talk about what happened and what was done and what was said. And said, this is what the Bible says about that. This is what, I mean, I'd even take commercials and teach about them, you know. Stop it. That's not, that guy's lying to you. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not going to make you happy. He just said, if you do this, you're going to be more loved and happier. It's not true. But that's just, that's what it means to take your time and use the words. The third point is just as simple. And it is, if this doesn't apply, then, then you've really missed the other two points. There has to be with your life. And he's, God is calling Abraham, and he says, Abraham will surely become a great and a very powerful nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. God says, I have chosen him so that he will direct his what? His children and his household and after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and what is just. Same thing God says to Abraham, you're going to teach your children the ways of God. You're going to teach your children what is just before God. You're going to teach your children what is righteous before God. Now, I know that I preach a message like this. There's always mixed emotions, you know. Some of us had dads who did this. Some of us didn't have dads who did this. You know, some of us had part-time dads. Some of us had multiple dads. Some had stepdads. And, hey, by the way, even if you do have a stepdad, Jesus had a stepdad, all right, and he honored him. But, you know, there's these mixed emotions that come, come through on Father's Day and then, then you're thinking about maybe your children have left home, and you think, well, I could have done a better job. Or maybe you got saved later in life when your kids were older, and now you're regretting that you didn't have... Listen, what is important is right now. You can't undo yesterday, last year, last month, but you can make a difference today. You can still be the person, and you can go to those kids and say, listen, I didn't get this when I should have got it, and I have failed. But I want you to know from this day forward... I'm warrior dad. <laughs> I'm on the front line. I'm believing God for you. I'm praying for you. I'm trusting God on your behalf. We're, we're going to see God do something in your life. And you make yourself available to be that dad. I, I, I've seen so many different scenarios through the years of, of, of serving the Lord with different situations. But I know my dad, you know, I, when I was about three, you know, he was gone, you know. And I, I had a stepdad and another stepdad before it was all said and done. Listen, God had a way of making up for that in my life. And I have found, as we sang earlier on, we can have a heavenly father who's a good, good father. You may be here, and maybe you, don't, you have a missing dad. Maybe you're one of those kind of young men here, young ladies today. You know? Hey, there's a bunch of dads here who've done a real good job over the years. I'll point them out to you. They'll help you out. Amen. <laughs> and you, you can approach them. You know, and say, hey, would you be the guy who would help me and give me some advice and counsel when I need? And I know a lot of men in this room who'd be willingly, willingly, gladly take that responsibility to minister to you and to pray for you and to lift you up. Listen, there's an opportunity for all of us. And praise God. Isn't it interesting that even God calls his, the church family? We're here as a family. We have to stand together. We have to encourage one another. I know for those kids who've grown up in Believer's Fellowship and you know, for maybe from being real young, 
Because you know what it's like. You didn't just have one set of parents. You had a bunch of parents around here running around and ministering to you and talking to you and encouraging you and sometimes fussing at you, you know, and telling you, quit running and whatever it might be. But God's been good to us. It's not too late in any of your lives, no matter what Satan might tell you, to make a difference in the world that you're living in. Abraham chose, was called the father of, of, of a great nation, but it was because Abraham made the commitment. He had his failures, he had his defeats, but ultimately he stood true to the word of God and to the will of God. And you can look through his life and you can point the failures out quickly. In fact, there's nobody in the Bible that you really can't point a failure out about something, it seems. Look around the room. There's nobody perfect in this room. You're not the perfect dad. You're not the perfect mom. Get over it. All right? I know so many parents that just beat themselves up, don't they? It's time to quit beating yourself up, quit being the punching bag for the devil, and say, hey, this is today. That's under the blood. I'm walking with God. We're going to do what? We're going to redeem the time that God gives us. Amen? We're going to redeem the time. And I love that passage. Is it Joel where it says, God will restore the years that the locust has eaten. He'll give you back what you didn't think you could get back. But it starts with faithfulness, with your life, being committed, impressing those words, as he said in Deuteronomy, upon your own heart first, and then following the Lord from that point on to do what God wants you to do with your life. Let me share this last scripture with you. This is about Amaziah. And it talks about Amaziah, and it says, you know, he did what was right, what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In everything, he followed the example of his father, Joash. He had a father who lived it. But he was wise enough to see the direction and the course that his father was living, and he embraced that for himself and said, I'm going to live it too. Now you have other who came after them who had a godly father, and they became a rebellious son, all right? There's no promises that your children are not going to be disobedient or rebellious. But we stay on the front line, and we continue to be godly, because I believe in due season, if we faint not, we will surely reap. And it's a principle that's applicable in every part of our life. Dads, today, I want to encourage you. Stand true, stand strong, be faithful, don't cut out. God has a proper plan and purpose for your life. Amen? And the story about a bunch of little boys sitting around arguing about how great their dads were and who their dads knew. One little boy said, my dad knows the chief of police. No, that ain't nothing. My dad, my dad knows the governor. Another, well, my dad knows the mayor. One little boy said, well, my dad knows God. Is that what your kid would say? My dad knows God. Because if you know God, that makes you a man of God. You're following his steps. Be faithful to him. Don't depart from what he's doing in your life. Be a man of God. Be the warrior dad that God's called you to be. I'm not going to give a usual invitation like we do many times on Sunday morning, but I am going to ask all our fathers and granddads that stood up a while ago, every father, why don't you just to make your way to the front. I want to pray over you today. All right, so every dad, I don't just sit there. Come on, if you're a dad, come on down. You got, you got kids, that makes you a dad. Every one of us men that are standing here have made mistakes in the process of parenting. All right, so get over it. <laughs> but the blood is available, so get under it. And you move forward. Satan's favorite method against us, moms and dads, is accusation and condemnation. But you can do something about that. You can claim the precious blood of Jesus. And then you move forward with that intercessory mindset, I'm going to stand in the gap for my kids and for my family. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to, I'm going to take hold of God's purposes for my life. And just commit yourself to being that warrior dad. And it requires prayer and faithfulness and communication. Even if they're not home. They still got phones. They still got email. They still listen to word. Just, just don't give up. Just keep being faithful. Just keep being strong. Keep being true. 
I'm going to ask as I pray for them, those of you out there, and maybe your, your dad's up here, and maybe your husband's up here, would you, would you pray for these men that are in this altar place today? And then maybe while you're there, you may just want to pray for your own dad today if he's still alive. Father, we come before you today, and I thank you that we gather with these men here. We realize that you are the perfect role model for us. You are a father. You refer to yourself as our father, our father which art in heaven. Help us to model the kind of father that you are to those you made us fathers over. I ask you, Lord, to touch the lives of each one of these men. You know exactly where they're at, and you know exactly what they're dealing with in their life. You know what their struggles are. You know where the hardships are. And my prayer today, along with all those who are praying, is that you would reach down in this moment and touch each of these men uniquely in the deepest area of their heart and soul where their greatest need resides, and that you would meet that need. So, Lord, as we would come and share our failures and our defeats, our sin, God, you'd wash us clean with the precious blood of the Lamb. You would cleanse us if the accuser that faces us all too often and lies to us and condemns us, that he would be bound from our hearts and our minds. And we would recommit and dedicate ourselves to you to be the man you've called us to be, to live our lives for your glory, committed totally to you with a passion, a desire, and a heart to honor you. Lord, that we would see our children and our children's children experience your revival in their life. It would transform them for the rest of their lives. May you be glorified with us, with our families. In Jesus' name, amen. You give these guys a great blessing and a praise the Lord, amen. God bless you, gentlemen. You may return to your seat. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. So glad you came to worship with us today. Praise the Lord. On Father's Day, again, that's a testimony to you men today. You came and, you know, we're here and despite the occasional rain. It's always amazing, you know, to listen to the weather. Uh, you know, are y'all enjoying the six inches of rain today? <laughs> you know, if I was correct as few times as they were, y'all would have fired me a long time ago. Anyway. God bless you today. I appreciate you being here. And again, happy Father's Day to each and every one. I pray you'll enjoy this day. It'll be a blessing to you. We have just a few closing announcements and things. Gary's going to come. Y'all say amen. amen. Praise the Lord.